Ladies and some gents, I have a question for you. What is your ideal proposal? Like, if you had the perfect, 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 perfect proposal, what would it be? How would you be dressed? Would you have a nice sunset dress? Or maybe you would you'd be, be dressed in something a little bit more comfortable. Or maybe something a lot, a lot more expensive. Oh. You can turn around. <laughs> what would the location be? Would you guys be on a cliff, at the beach, the first place you guys met, the first place you guys kissed? I promise you, I promise you, regardless of what you may say, there's one commonality in every single person's ideal proposal scenario. And that thing is a ring. A big, fat, diamond ring. The shinier it is, the bigger it is, the pricier it is, the better. But gents now i'm talking to the gents between you and me usually those rings are pretty expensive and the reason why they're expensive is because diamonds are considered to be very very rare but what if i told you that the idea of diamonds being rare is a complete lie what if i told you that we have more diamonds than we need what if i told you that the idea of having a diamond ring for an engagement when you're making a proposal was completely made up by a South African company. And what if I told you that we can actually grow diamonds, like literally make diamonds from scratch? Just hear me out. When I say a South African company, I mean the beers. Now, you might not know about them, but this used to be one of the biggest companies ever, especially in South Africa, and they were a true monopoly. I know that I bring up this idea of monopolies quite often in this channel, but they're very interesting. And this one is the most, or one of the most interesting. Now, this company started about 133 years ago. It was started by a man named Cecil John Rhodes. You guys might know him. He's the guy who founded Rhodesia, which is now modern day Zimbabwe. And when he was starting this company, he was funded by a gold magnate. His name is Albert Bates and the Rothschilds. If you guys don't know the Rothschild, hear this out. The Rothschild is one of those families. You know when they say that, you know those conspiracy theories that like the people at the top are trying to get us? They usually target families like the Rothschilds because they are one of the richest families in existence. This is a generational wealth kind of situation where they have been flipping rich for a lot of time. Their net worth because of the fact that they're such a secretive family is very much unknown but people have estimations and they range from about 400 billion dollars to about 10 trillion dollars so apparently they have a foot in every single facet of society and they make money in any and every way possible that's all i know everything else is a conspiracy theory now he started buying up old mines as soon as diamond deposits were discovered in south africa eventually he had control of all diamond mines in south africa that's when he was approached by a London-based diamond syndicate. Now, just so that we can make sure that we don't confuse each other here, syndicate and a cartel are basically the same thing. Now, what a cartel slash syndicate is, is basically a group of companies that come together in order to make sure that they're the only ones who stay in power. So, for example, the bread industry has only a few competitors, say Blue Ribbon, Sasco, Bukomo, whatever. Say that all of these companies had to come together and say we are all going to sell bread at 15 rand standard price for every single brand. They basically formed a cartel slash syndicate because they've decided to make a decision about the entire industry amongst themselves because they're the biggest players in that industry. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, here's a definition. The deal that this syndicate wanted to make is that 
De Beers only sells diamonds to the syndicate. In other words, since De Beers basically has controlled the world supply of diamonds because most diamonds at the time were found in South Africa, it meant that they are only allowing this specific syndicate to own their diamonds, to buy their diamonds, meaning no other retailer can do that. Meaning at that time, you couldn't exactly open up a diamond store because all the diamonds are going to one person. Meanwhile, in a mine called the Premier Mine, the Cullinan was found. This is hands down the biggest diamond we have ever found. Hey guys, Wayne here. Um, I know this is kind of unprofessional. I'm even holding the tripod with my hand so you can see why it's wobbly. But I just want to drop some quick information about the Cullinan. The Cullinan, when it was found, it was gifted to some King Edward the, the fifth or the fourth, I think. And then after that, it, get, it kept getting passed on and on and on in the royal family. But it got cut into nine different pieces, right? So there was the biggest piece, and the biggest piece is right now on the Queen's spectra or spectre. It's basically her stick. And then the second largest pieces are found on crowns, and then there are a couple more that are in earrings, and another one that's in a necklace. I don't know about you guys, but the fact that something called the Star of Africa is in the crown of someone who is nowhere near African kind of bothers me. As and, it, and to make matters worse, to make matters worse, the name of the of that second biggest piece is the second Star of Africa. The Beers wanted to buy this mine from the owner, but the owner instead decided to sell this mine to two brothers, the Oppenheimers. And before they knew it, before De Beers knew it, the Oppenheimer started producing a lot more diamonds and they started to match the production numbers of De Beers. But eventually they formed one company in order to control the entire world's supply of diamonds. That's essentially the entire gist of it. Except for one thing. You can have all of these diamonds, but they mean absolutely nothing if you haven't given people a reason to buy them. The diamond engagement ring. How else could two months' salary last forever? Now, before we get too far, let's just acknowledge the goal that the beers had. They wanted to convince people to value diamonds more than any other jewel. Meaning that they wanted people to see diamonds on a different category, in a different level, as compared to something like an emerald, sapphire, or a ruby. So they came up with a plan. Convince women that a diamond is the best and most important thing she needs to get before she dies. Now, the first thing that they did is that they went to a lot of movie studios and paid them to show a De Beers diamond in every single romantic scene that they can. Show a lot of emphasis on the diamond and give it a good look. Make sure that the cameraman focuses on it for a good couple of seconds so that the person who is watching this, more specifically, the woman who is watching this, is actually going to feel as though it's something that they would like for themselves. The second thing that they did is that they had a lot of high-end celebrities wear the most extravagant of diamond rings and diamond necklaces they could possibly get. The third thing that they did is that they ran a lot of ads and these ads were trying to push the idea that for a man to show you as much commitment as he possibly can, he needs to give you a ring that costs at least two months salary. At least. The fourth thing is that they pushed the most famous slogan ever. The diamond is forever. This year, give her the diamond that will take her breath away. The moment that people hear that, they wanted to push the idea that like your relationship, like the love that you share with your one and only, this diamond is forever. The more expensive, the more elaborate, the rarer the diamond is, the more your man apparently loves you. But there's one more thing that they did, and this is the last thing, and they did it, this is for me like the craziest thing that they did, because all those things are impressive on their own, but the thing that they did is this. They started to send representatives of De Beers and the ad agency that they hired to have this campaign to actually go to schools 
and have assemblies where they would tell girls about the stuff. Now, I'm getting this from a memorandum that this ad agency sent to De Beers, and I'm gonna quote what they said here. All these lectures revolve around the diamond engagement ring and are reaching thousands of girls in their assemblies, classes, and, inform and informal meetings in our educational, our leading educational institutions. They literally had like live ads for little girls. And the reason why they did this is because they weren't expecting them to exactly like go to American Swiss and buy a couple of diamond rings after school, but rather that they'd be convinced of the idea that a diamond, a diamond ring really is something that a woman should get, really is something that a man who really deserves you should be able to give you. This campaign worked very, very well. By the Beers' peak, they had about 80% of every single engagement in the USA involving a diamond ring that is owned or sold by them. And when the campaign wasn't working too well, on times when it would be a little bit slow, they switched it up and they did something different. They brought in the idea of having a second ring be given years into the marriage. In other words, an anniversary ring. Basically a ring that says, hey, in case the ring that I bought you initially somehow doesn't convince you that I love you anymore, here's another one. Now, not everything that they did worked like a charm. There was a point where the sales started to slow down and they decided to market their rings to men, having a ring, a diamond ring for a man. Now, there were a few reasons why this didn't work. The first reason is that the wage levels that women were receiving at the time weren't high enough to even justify buying a ring for a man. The second thing is the fact that De Beers had already spent so much time and so much money convincing the world that a ring is meant to be desired by a woman but bought by a man. And to just switch it around like that would just confuse the market because of the fact that they are the monopoly. They are the people who run the sale of diamonds all over the world. And the last reason is the fact that diamonds as much as other jewelry was oftentimes and has always been marketed towards women. They've always been seen as a sign of femininity. Obviously now that has changed with the emergence of ice culture, but at the time that was the main consensus. And it would be very difficult to justify why a guy would want something that you only see women with. Now, the Beers was an empire. What they were running was a massive empire. And like all empires, it eventually fell. Right now, they're controlling about less than 35% of the entire diamond industry, even though they were controlling 90% at their peak. The reason why that is is because they haven't been able to develop as quickly as the world has managed to change. And they have another problem. Lab diamonds. We're growing diamonds that are identical in every way to a mine stone. They are identical even under a microscope. They're chemically, optically, and physically the same as mine diamonds. The fact that we now know how to make diamonds. Here's how, actually no, I'm not gonna go through how they do it because it involves a lot of physics and I dropped that in grade 10 for a reason. And here's another thing about lab grown diamonds. It's the fact that they are actually cheaper and more sustainable than mined diamonds because absolutely nothing is ever good about mining except for the fact that it provides jobs. The environmental cost specifically with diamond mining and also the idea of blood diamonds, I'm not going to talk about it in this video, but the idea of blood diamonds just shows that it might actually get to the point where mining is just too expensive to do. And this is actually a good news for a lot of wallets. And as much as lab grown diamonds are great for a lot of reasons, they might be bad for one. Now, ladies, I have a question. In that proposal, would you rather have your boyfriend propose to you with a 500 rand ring or a 15,000 rand ring? And chances are you would pick the more expensive ring. Same thing as if I would ask you, what, what kind of champagne would you prefer? Would you prefer a 100 rand champagne or would you prefer a 1000 rand champagne? Obviously you would take the 1000 rand. The reason why is because goods such as diamonds and wines are considered veblen goods. 
meaning that there is a perceived increase in value when there's an increase in the price. So this is going to really question the idea of or the importance or actually the validity of a diamond. It's going to get to the point where people can't tell the difference whether I get you a ruby, a ruby ring or an emerald ring as, com as to compare to a diamond ring that I'm proposing to you because of the fact that they are all around the same price because a diamond isn't going to be considered rare anymore because now we can make them and besides that they were never rare to begin with because the BS is just stockpiling all the diamonds they had. And that's it for the video guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I put a lot of effort into this one. And before I go, I'm going to bring back something that I stopped for some reason. The extra fact at the end. And this one is about how a diamond is valued. Now, in the diamond industry, they always talk about something called the four C's, which is the cut, color, clarity, and the carrot of a diamond. These are the four standards of how you determine whether a diamond is good or not. Now, cut means that it shouldn't be too flat at the top and it shouldn't be too narrow at the bottom. The cut has to be just right. The clarity means that there shouldn't be any smudges, meaning that inside the diamond, it should be clear as crystal. And the color means that it should either be a very, very clear color, very see-through, or very bright. It cannot be slightly shaded because then it just looks a little funny. So it can either be a bright diamond, like a yellow diamond, or a normal clear diamond. And the carrot means that, it just means weight. So whenever they're talking about a certain amount of carrots, it just means that it's heavy diamonds. So that's how you determine the weight of a diamond in carrots. Before I go, guys, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, share, anything and everything as long as you watch this video. And thank you for everyone who's been watching my videos lately. And I will keep producing more videos and trying to improve on them. But besides all of that, I would like to say have a good, good rest of your holidays. And thank you for hearing me out.